Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRO and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Reasons Libraries Are Expanding to Influence Academic Research, Perspectives from Two Library Deans, which is sponsored by Ex Libris, a ProQuest company. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRO and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations offer the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd just like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, you can click the little arrows beside those words to expand or collapse the uh, panels. Um, you can use the Q&A panel to put questions to our speakers at the end of the presentation. We'll take some time to answer as many questions as we have uh, time for. So please do put in your questions throughout the presentation. The chat panel is where you can reach me with any of your technical questions. Um, if you're having difficulties with audio or video or the visuals, anything like that, let me know and we will troubleshoot the issue there privately. Um, also note that we are recording today's program and that every, everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. All right, and that is enough out of me. So I will take this opportunity to turn the floor over to Jessica. Great. Thanks, Mark. And hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar, Reasons Libraries Are Expanding to Influence Academic Research. Thank you for joining us today for what I'm sure will be an excellent session on library supporting research. Um, my name is Jessica, as I mentioned, and I'm a former Associate University Librarian for Research and Education at the University of Buffalo. I'm calling uh, from my home in Buffalo, New York. And I've been an academic librarian for well over a decade, working in a variety of academic libraries while focusing on the research ecosystem and scholarly communication. About a year and a half ago, I joined Ex Libris as part of their research solutions team, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to join you today. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I do want to address the elephant in the room. Um, a colleague helped me find this image, and personally, I believe the most unrealistic aspect of it is how neat and tidy the room is, considering there's a baby in the picture. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you have children or you know a small child, but all I know is my house definitely does not look like that. Um, but anyway, what I'm trying to say is that between the time this webinar was planned and today, the world has changed around us in myriad ways. The pandemic is certainly the most significant event, uh, but many social, economic, and political changes are impacting all of us. Um, higher education and libraries, I hope, will be part of the positive change we need to constantly work towards. And one of the ways we can do this is through research and information sharing. Being a trusted advisor, strategic partner, and working collaboratively in the research and scholarly ecosystem is something that academic and research libraries are currently navigating. As we shift from collections to shared collections and services, what role does the academic library serve? How can you scale up to manage all institutional research and scholarship? And I think this is something that applies to um, liberal arts institutions, R1 institutions, and everybody in between. Recent, recent symposia, conferences, and sessions like this have articulated the success and impediments to support the research enterprise and the strategy they pursued to be seen as key partners and not just supporters of campus initiatives. Library thought leaders are seeking ways to better align with their current research practices and to engage as vital partners in the campus research ecosystem. And there are critical necessary changes to be made and libraries are developing new means and partnerships to sustain and increase their relevance. And I think, you know, one of the key qualities that successful initiatives have has been strong library leadership. And that means the strength to have the conversation with senior campus leadership about why supporting the research enterprise 
really is a role for the library and the trust to pivot into new and more impactful roles on campus. And, you know, in my opinion, one of the most important pieces of that is the vision for making it happen. Uh, speaking of which, uh, now I'm pleased to introduce you to two of those strong library leaders who will share with you more specifically how they're positioning the library on their campus to be a strong partner in research. First, we have Amy Kautzman, Dean and Director of the University Library at Sacramento State and California, and Tracy Elliott, who's the former Dean of the Library at San Jose State University in California, and now she's the Dean of the Library at Florida Gulf Coast University, so, congrat so congratulations on moving to the East Coast. Um, you're in my time zone now. Uh, during, <laughs> during their presentation, uh, please feel free to add questions into the chat as as they arise in your mind. Um, like Mark said, we do have some time at the end for Q&A, um, which I'll be moderating at the end of the presentation. So Amy, now I will move this over to you. Great, thank you, Jessica, and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm pleased that you could join us today. I'm going to speak about the Sac State perspective of moving to ex libris and how we think that will help us to empower our faculty and our university to really celebrate the work that our faculty do. But first, let me begin by giving a little bit of a CSU overview. Both Tracy and myself were in the same system. And if you know a little bit about the history of higher education, you are more than well aware of the California Master Plan, um, the sandwich of three universities, and, and we are the um, peanut butter and jelly right in the middle. There is the University of California system, which is primarily made up of research institutions, the CSUs, which are um, a mix of research and serious teaching, and then the community colleges. The CSUs are made up of 23 different campuses, and we are the largest university system in the US with over 480,000 students. It's a large system, it's a collective system, we work in partnership, and um, it's a fascinating time to be in such a large system. Sacramento State is in the capital of California, almost but not quite smack dab in the middle. And we are literally about two, two and a half miles away from the capital of California. We're a fairly new university, founded in 1947, uh, but we have over 31,000 students and we are um, largely made up of underrepresented minorities and first-gen students. And I can't tell you how happy so many of our students are today that the Supreme Court has uh, fallen on our side mm. regarding DACA. It's a wonderful time for, for our community and for California. But we are deeply embedded in our, in our community. One in 20 Sacramento residents are alums of this campus. And a good many of the state employees who work for our capital go through our master's programs. So we are a very diverse university, as I said. Um, we are a Hispanic serving institution and a PZ, uh, ranked 19th in the number of Latinx students who graduated from the university with a bachelor's degree. In fact, for two years running now, I believe, our Latinx graduates um, are graduating at one of the highest percentages and higher than our Caucasian males on campus. So we have actually bridged and improved the gap for our students. We're a solid state university and, and we are proud of that fact. We are also a supplier of um, teachers and you know, in, our, in our K through 12 systems and we also supply a steady stream of scholars from many different backgrounds to PhD programs, and we help to build the middle class of the state. Tracy? Great. So San Jose State University is actually in Silicon Valley. And uh, so we are the Silicon Valley campus of the CSU and, and the only institution, uh, public institution of higher learning in Silicon Valley um, at, at a university level, because we obviously have a few community colleges as well. 
Uh, we are the founding campus of the California State University system established in 1857. Um, SJSU has 34,000 students, uh, quite a lot of graduate students, and, and proud that our diversity index is 70%. Um, and we have 1,000 tenure line faculty, 1,200 lecturers and adjuncts. And um, just like Amy, we get to brag about all the, our, our great distinguished um, rankings uh, it, for the university. Oh, went too far. Yeah, so. Sorry about Amy, that. <laughs> Jessica's out, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> So um, one of the things I want to talk about and what I think makes us interesting is that we are a campus in transition. And I think that this is the case for many of the M1s to M3s. Um, and having spent my entire career in R1s until I came to the CSU system, you know, it's interesting to see a campus that was an absolute teaching college grow its research um, wings. And I think that this is something that every faculty member and every librarian um, who's in higher education right now understands is that our faculty are being asked to publish and do scholarship at a higher rate than ever before. It's the lingua franca of success in higher education. And we used to have, when we started this university, the ability to basically earn tenure through your teaching and your success in moving students forward. And obviously that still is the core value that we carry forward, but so many of our faculty now are expected to publish as well as carry a heavy teaching load. And so the question we have as a library is how do we support our faculty who have greater expectations upon them? Um, unlike the R1s, we do not have as many grad students. We have some grad students who help with the teaching and research that goes on, but nothing to the degree of, of a large research institution. How does the library help to move and amplify the research that is happening on campus? One of our um, outreach and solutions is to work with our Office of Research Innovation and Economic Development, basically our Office of Research Affairs on campus. Um, they're with academic affairs just as we are, and we have a new head of OREAD, Yvonne, um, who really works with us and, and the library to help to push forward our faculty's research to the president's office, to the provost, and also out to our greater community. How do we celebrate and push our information out and show that we are doing more research than people would sometimes expect us to do in an M1 institute? And so when we were looking at what our problems were in trying to amplify faculty research, we realized that we weren't and we didn't have a strong process for tracking research, our creative um, or scholarship on, on many levels. I mean, departments knew what their faculty were doing. Oftentimes colleges were able to tell, but we would have a question come to us from um, our mayor of Sacramento saying, we need help with homelessness. Who do you have on your campus that has expertise? And of course, we're going to have expertise through our health, health sciences, through our nursing programs, through our engineering group, which is looking at how to build tiny homes, social sciences, our social workers. Um, there's all sorts of people, political scientists who are studying this, but there was no way to just search and find and pull all these people together. How do you connect your scholars when you want to have a conversation? We would have local entrepreneurs, oh, somebody bump me around there, local entrepreneurs who would ask us uh, for business expertise. We would not be able to easily connect people. And we also really couldn't tell our story. We couldn't say, this is how many books, journals. Um, we could tell grants, money, but other, other sorts of answers we couldn't give. And we were also looking at really solidifying our practice as an anchor university. And that means that we work and are part of our community. And our president, uh, President Robert Nelson, um, really wanted to be able to connect the city to our scholars. And we needed to find a system that would help to build that. And we felt like a squirrel would be a tool 
that could really um, celebrate the work that we're doing and give us the data and the ability to tell the stories. Obviously, we're not looking for impact factors to the same degree as some research institutes, but we do need to be able to show how we're making a difference. And like many campuses, well, actually, unlike many, we're, we're not a conservative campus. We're very entrepreneurial and very startup bootstrappy. However, faculty can be conservative by nature because they have so many um, calls for their time, be it teaching, research. Whenever you talk about bringing in a new software that helps to support faculty, the first fear that they have is, oh my gosh, what is this going to cost me time-wise to bring something mm -hmm. up? And this is where the library can be helpful. Also, libraries have all the skill sets where we can act as the epicenter of a sporo. Who better to gather, to co-locate information, to order it, and then repurpose it than a library? Um, we also had all of our recently hired faculty, both the teaching faculty as well as our library faculty, who were really looking for new ways to present their work, who were looking for ways of improving our faculty profiles, and that gave us an opening. Ex Libris is a trusted partner with the CSUs. I, I actually realized the other day that I've been working with Ex Libris for some time. Um, <laughs> And, and since 1994, and, and so while this is a new tool, it's a strong partnership. And of course, this place is the library at the center of faculty research and the conversation around how we can best support them. Also, one of the things that I feel is so important is in a university like the CSU, you know, and, and just to frame the CSU, we may not be the university that will discover the cure for COVID-19, but we will be the university that does all the actions to push out the scientific support and the health support to our communities. We're the universities where ethnic studies began at um, San Francisco State University in 1969. We're the university where women's studies began in San Diego State in 1970. We are a university of emerging practices and different voices. And that can't always happen in an R1 where history and tradition rules the day. I can say coming from a 400 year old university. You know, we really look for there to be true equity and diversity in everything that we put forward. And by us being able to celebrate our research and scholarship and creative activities through all of the voices that are represented on our campus, we're able to put forward a more interesting um, set of, of um, research and, and scholarship solutions. And I think that this is where the CSUs are a little more interesting. And with that, Trace, I'll move it over to you. Thank you, Amy. So San Jose State has somewhat of a, a more mature research enterprise, but it is certainly blooming. Um, they are averaging 60 million a year in funded research, but there is a new goal that was laid out through our strategic plan, um, Transformation 2030, to raise that up to 150 million of sponsored research. The strengths that SJSU has in the research areas are human factors, health equity, fire science, supercomputing, astrophysics, deep humanities, biomedical engineering, marine science, and geology. And over a year ago, uh, just barely a year ago, they hired the first vice president of research and innovation and created an entire division of research and innovation. And with that, the department has grown to an AVP of research, Director of Research Development, which has started, that person started six months ago, and they're currently uh, searching for a Director of Innovation at SJSU. So it, there is a lot of resources being put into really ramping up the, the research enterprise at SJSU. Now the library, um, I, I started at San Jose four years ago, uh, I just left a few months ago and now I'm at Florida Gulf Coast, but during the, the, the first three years that I was there, we went through uh, some work reorganization. We, and the idea was to 
to bring in the expertise that we didn't already have um, in some areas of the library in ways that the library could support the research enterprise that already existed at San Jose State. And we, we did the survey of campus and, and talked to those folks that were um, doing support for research already on campus and finding what the holes were and determining whether or not we had the expertise or uh, the systems in place in order to be able to provide some of that expertise. And we settled on research impact, data services, open access and digital scholarship expertise. So we hired quite a number of folks that brought that expertise or we worked with those librarians that had that interest and made sure that, that they were able to get the professional development they needed in order to be able to provide these services. So the other thing that the library did is not just supporting research, but also innovation. And we opened the first startup incubator at the university in the library, which includes a materials library, a five button studio, ideation tools, prototyping equipment, and an electronics lab. Also, the, the library had already established a pretty robust institutional repository for an M1. Um, as of the 15th, which I think was Monday, uh, there were 26,728 papers in wow. the repository. Um, you know, you can see the numbers, 1 million downloads just this year and over um, close to 6 million downloads total. So there was definitely some existing expertise in the library and an understanding of the role of the library of doing those things that Amy talked about as far as showcasing, recording and showcasing the, the work of the institution. Um, as far as research and scholarship and, and creative activity. Um, but there were definitely some things the university needed as far as, as help with. So that's why we created those other positions. Okay, and, and since the university has decided to, to ramp up the research and innovation um, enterprise, I started meeting with the vice president of research and innovation monthly. This was great. I mean, it was kind of great being able to talk with him because he was a division, an entire university division of one <laughs> when he started. So he needed partnerships across the campus and he was really great at outreach. I have to say um, he, he came to every council of deans meeting, the academic affairs leadership team meetings, but he also met with the deans one on one and he and I created a couple of um, initiatives, including getting everybody to sign up for an ORC ID and, 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 a, and a few other things. Um, and so we also were able to get our Associate Dean of Research and Scholarship on the University Research Advisory Committee. So the library is very embedded from the beginning in the growth of research when the university made the distinct decision that this is something that they're going to, to definitely invest in and ramp up. Um, and, and we definitely realized that there were some needs when we did the, the campus survey, including that we, I learned from my fellow deans that they didn't really know that much about what research their faculty were doing, never mind what the community knew or other researchers or other institutions. Um, I mean, they knew about the key, you know, the people who had the biggest grants, but they actually admitted they weren't sure what, what research their faculty were doing. Um, and the university does not have a comprehensive directory of research and expertise, even though there's a pretty robust institutional repository, there's a, a, a somewhat of a CRM type of uh, program that the marketing and communications department created in order to be able to connect news agencies with our experts on campus. But it certainly none of this was is comprehensive. So there was a and then the other need from the university was to increase the profile of, of the research impact. So what the VPRI and our provost and our president were really looking for was a way to connect researchers with other researchers. And if people don't know that you have these experts on your campus, 
they're not going <laughs> to find their their collaborators and and same and and likewise our our faculty need to be able to connect with other researchers so um, and then the library certainly plays a, a role in the share of findings the data and and ways to collaborate and then the deans also felt that the faculty would benefit from guidance on how to increase the impact of their research and scholarship so the library actually is positioned very well to um, to support the research enterprise at SJSU. The final need is the 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 impact to measure the impact, the metrics of university wide research. So there's there's so many ways that the vice president of research innovation and now his his fellow his staff members are starting to realize that. The partnership with the library is extremely important for them because they can't do all of this work. They're, first of all, there's only three of them right now, and they're really, really concentrating on right right now. The concentration on is ramping up the the sponsored research, so helping faculty and other and students find research grants. So the library is kind of doing all this other work in collaboration with them and, and in consultation with them. Then my, what have I done at Florida Gulf Coast? Well, I, we, I got here and there was no one in the library. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> everybody was was at home pretty much. Um, so we, I've been learning about what the needs are, but. I was able, right prior to leaving San Jose State, I was able to participate in, um, in a Sploro analytics forum uh, with some senior research officers and library deans and a lot of um, associate deans from libraries. And uh, we talked about with the ex Libris folks, what were the most important analytics we needed out of um, a Sploro. And it was, it was amazing and probably the best opportunity I had to better understand our vice president of research and innovation and what his what were the mandates being placed on him as far as um, what metrics he needed in order to be successful and what the university needed. And I got two major, major takeaways from this. He wasn't the only one there. Uh, Amy had her. Associate Vice President of Research from um, Sac State. There were representatives from the University of Miami, uh, University of Montana, and several other institutions. So, and everybody had someone from their Office of Research or their Research Division in SJSU's case um, participating in this. So it was fascinating to hear those things that were important to them as opposed to what we think is important for them. Yeah. Um, and the, the two takeaways were that the the VPs and AVPs have a lot. <laughs> they have a lot of needs mm -hmm. as far as metrics. Many, many more needs than than we ever could have known that they would need if we hadn't participated in the um, the forum. And then the other thing that was is a sort of a eye opening for me was that they have no problem with the library providing the tools and managing the tools to get these metrics, but they do not want us to be the gatekeepers of the data. And there was some back and forth discussion at that forum about, well, the librarians want to be able to control the message of what this what this data is telling you and the vice president. And vice presidents that were there and associate vice presidents were there were like, no, we don't need you to do that for us. <laughs> we want to have act when they saw the da the dashboard that was available in Floro, they unequivocally decided that they needed to have access to that. So I think that's something that we need to really keep in mind that you know we're, we don't give people access to our ILS dashboards and metrics. But as far as tools that that create faculty profiles and and keep track of, of what their output is, their research output is, our 
our partners in Office of Research are going to want to have access to that information and they want to be able to manipulate the data and not have to go through us and ask us for reports. And, and I think that's fantastic. Uh, we can do a great job helping them by making sure that the, the tools are comprehensive, that they are um, current, and in and, and many other ways, and to assist the faculty as they develop their, their own profiles. There, there's so many roles for us as a library. We do not need to be the gatekeepers of this information. I think that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. I think that that's a really strong ending, and you know, we're definitely grateful that we have such a strong research council, and there was such great attendance from the library community and the research community at that at that symposium. It, I know it was one of the last uh, travel events I had before we were all working <laughs> from home. Um, and so I see a few questions popping up in the chat. So, you know, please start, you know, typing some of your questions. I did see someone ask, you know, what what are we talking about? Um, but the the product, <laughs> the the Ex Libris product is something called Esploro, and what it is is it's a research information management system with a research repository at the core. So for those of you who are, you know, analyzing your institutional repository or trying to find ways to better partner and support the research enterprise, um, we would love to talk to you about Esploro. Um, and, you know, one of the questions that I have, um, you know, I. I feel like I, I couldn't not start with this question is, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges or changes that you're dealing with in a post COVID higher ed environment? Okay, well, besides funding, which <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, I, I think that's, that's another elephant in the room. Um, sure. We don't really even know what the impact of that is going to be. We don't know how long it's going to be an impact, but it certainly has uh, Stop the momentum of what we were doing on campus. So I think that the way we are we are adapting is preparing ourselves to be more to have more distributed services and more remote services for our for our campus constituency and for our community. Yeah, I think it's the balance between what services can we offer and as librarians, as people who are really hell bent on, on ensuring that research and scholarship and, and instruction goes forward at all costs, it's tricky to balance that with safety and concern mm -hmm. for our faculty and staff, um, people who are undergoing a great amount of stress um, through all of the racial inequities that we're dealing with, you know, the, the police brutality is affecting groups of our uh, faculty and staff more than others, illnesses, job losses throughout families. So we have some folks who are working for us who are being pulled in many directions more so than ever before. And we have to be very cognizant of being a loving and supportive institution while still ensuring that we can take care of our students and, and, and do the business that we have to do. Um, I find it really interesting that you know, we're right on the cusp of moving forward with our Esploro project. You know, our kickoff is next week. We're reaching out to our faculty who are on our committee's advisors, and it's kind of waking up in a Rip Van Winkle sort of way saying, oh my gosh, we've been having these conversations for months, and we put down the phone for three months, and now we're picking it back up again. Mm -hmm. And how do we make this happen? And 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 this floor is just one example of that. You know, we've been in such a reactionary mode, and I think how we reimagine the library, reimagine higher education, reimagine our jobs, not trying to do what we were doing before, but from afar, but really trying to consider in a very creative fashion, what is it we're trying to solve? How is it we're trying to be in the world? And what are the new approaches we can bring? Because I think if we just keep comparing what we have been doing to what we used to do, we're going to fail. So it, it's, it's a time for a seismic shift and, and trying to see that pathway forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly not an easy 
question to grapple with, let alone mm -hmm. trying to answer. Um, one comment or one question from Caroline says, we're, she was quoting Amy, I believe, and saying, we're trying to support the increased research needs of our faculty, which means new and additional work for, for the library. So how mm -hmm. are you as deans advocating for the additional funding, staffing resources to fulfill this need? So how are you, how are you able to get this done? So I will tell you that we have champagne aspirations on a beer budget, you know, and <laughs> it is always going to be our reality. Um, I, I think there's a, a Finnish expression, Jugard, J-U-G-A-A-D, that really means to make something out of found objects. You know, how do you move forward? <laughs> and, 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 and some people won't like this answer, but going back to how everything that we're doing in library land is changing, we're really looking hard at what's happening in our libraries, especially with acquisitions and processing and saying, what can be automated? What work doesn't exist in the same way anymore? And then can we reapply people who have been doing tasks that aren't as necessary anymore going into the future uh, to something like a Splural? And we spent a year, about two years ago, during, doing a workflow for every single um, task in our collections and acquisitions unit, in our technical mm -hmm. services unit, what we call collections management services. And we were able to really have difficult, exciting, um, and, and scintillating conversations over what is it we're really doing and what has to happen. And it was a great conversation because it brought us all close together, but it also made us realize that we probably could move into more scholarly communication support. And we were able to get that position and we were able to put more focus on training people. Mm -hmm. And we do expect that there is going to be about a year of pain. Imagine if you're remodeling your entire house, mm -hmm. you know, you might have to move out for a little bit or else you're going to live in one room with a hot plate and it's not going to be fun. <laughs> but after that year, you will have something that is fairly automated, and you'll still need some checks and balances with people with cataloging detail-oriented skills, but we have those people who will probably not, not be doing some other tasks, and how do we move forward to that? If we think for one minute that everything we're buying online right now to serve our people from afar, if we think we're going to go back to buying physical items Anytime in the near future, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I don't know how long it's going to be before we go back to the library full on, before we are fully on campus. It could be a year. It could be two years, quite honestly. But we're going to shift our entire collections approach. And I'd be surprised if we buy any physical items in the next fiscal year. And, and I think that will change how we process and then what those people can do. Wow. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think, I think adding on to that, I, I, I think one of the things that was really helpful or has been helpful to, you know, position the library to receive funding for the, the, this type of service is just showing our successes in, in how we do what we do. The fact that we are Mm -hmm. experts in metadata creation and so that mm -hmm. we can ensure that our faculty resources our research is, is found that, you know, we are the experts in helping people find information. And and that's the same thing with people finding and, and identifying San Jose State as, as as experts in all these different subject area research areas. And and I think that that's it. You're you want to convince the administration who has to make very tough decisions at times about where money is going to go, that you are a good return on that investment, yes. that you will make the most out of that. And I think Amy's right. You have to, you can't already be an organization that's a drain on your institution and you're not able to show a return on investment already. So mm -hmm. if you have a lot of legacy processes, uh, I, first one comes to mind, a lot of people devoted to periodical support, right? Mm -hmm. If these things that we've been doing for so long, if, you, if you're not re, reallocating the, that expertise and, and finding much more important things for those folks to be doing, then they're not going to invest in you. 
they have to see some movement in the library. They have to know that you're adapting and that you're changing and that you're meeting the needs of the institution or else you will not get the financial support and you will not be able to make the argument. You have to show them that you already are doing what the university needs to be doing and that you can do even more with a little bit more support mm -hmm. from them. Yeah, that's a that's a really important point, Tracy. A uh, question from Adam. Can you talk a little bit about who is working on this at each of your library? Was it one person leading the charge? Was it a committee who served on it? So I think really the question is, how did you get this done? <laughs> <laughs> it took a year. It took a year. <laughs> Let, let's be real. Um, you have to sell the product first to you know ourselves. Because there's all mm -hmm. sorts of amazing products out there, and um, somebody asked if this is like digital measures. Parts of it, yes, but it goes mm -hmm. beyond digital measures. Um, I think Explore in some ways takes a number of programs that are out there and expands upon it. And there are some programs that might go a little bit deeper, but they're more they're they're more narrow, and um, they're also much much more expensive. But we had to do some deep work into what is it we were trying to solve? What were the products out there? You know, so we did our internal um, work, myself and my associate deans and, and systems folks. Then we began the conversation with provost and the fellow deans because this is an academic support program. And if we do not sell our faculty and academics on why this is useful to them, we're dead in the water. You know, it's, it's, it's like bringing a spaceship to a picnic. You know, nobody really wants a spaceship at a picnic. I don't know where I got that an analogy at. But but um, <laughs> it takes it takes a lot of work to sell it on campus. And keep in mind that when we have something like this, you're talking about campus communications. You're talking about the president's office. You're talking about every single college. You're talking about the Office of Research Affairs. You have to really look at all of the people who might be interested in what this could do for us and then have those conversations and it will take a while because institutions of learning are small c conservative in their actions and bringing in a new database is a tricky thing what, what would you throw in tracy so i think one of the things that i think that i'm not really sure where the question is it, it might be in the development and of the product and I think what you'll find is that it takes less people to do that than what Amy is talking about, because you can get this product working up and running with with minimal support or or you're you're moving people. Right. So in our mm -hmm. case, we had digital commons. We already had people that were spending lots of time developing individual portfolios of our faculty and each profile was taking 80 hours per person. So or per faculty member. So we were able to reallocate those towards the development of, of a Sploro. But the real work is the outreach. It's about finding that first group of faculty because you want to show the value added of how it'll tell the story of the, the Department of Software Engineering and then the College of Engineering and then the, the College of Health and Human Sciences and and the nursing department. You you want to be able to show that it, it isn't just about the individual faculty member. So you it, and once you get a couple of those representatives, then it's easier to 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 sell it from there, right? But that's the hardest part is the outreach. It's getting the faculty to participate and and seeing why because we're going from a system that is largely concierge service with digital commons to one that's more self service. And, you know, it's, it's in some ways it's a much easier sell because some of your faculty are more about that. They, they have very elaborate profiles in multiple free sources out there uh, that, that are profiles of their research. So, it, so they're, they're much more likely to want to do this. But when you're talking about a department, you have the, a range of different types of personalities within that department. And so it, it's hard to get everybody to agree to do this and to give you the attention that you need to be able to get them into into the um, the product. 
So I think that's that's the real work, the outreach. Yeah. It's not the development. Yeah. And I want to add just a little bit because I was an IR manager and I've worked with different IR software in my librarian roles that <laughs> one of the most interesting aspects of Esploro to me was the fact that it will automatically populate the researcher profiles. So you don't have to spend 80 hours populating mm -hmm. a single <laughs> a single profile. So when you think about, you know, operating at scale, um, you know, I feel like a lot of libraries have, you know, like the same proportion of of uh, or a similar proportion of library staff and they just have to decide how that's allocated. So whether you're at a small library or a large library, um, you know, you definitely have a lot of different types of support that you have to offer. And by removing the lift of having to do all of that manual data entry and, or trying to help the faculty do it themselves, um, one of the guiding principles of Esploro is that we don't want to change the habits of faculty and we don't want to add to their workload because we know how overtaxed faculty are, including library faculty. So that was one of the aspects that, you know, immediately got my attention and it's something that we hear from uh, the deans today and a lot of the other librarians that we that we speak to. And that's exactly what sold us at San Jose State on the product, uh, the Esploro product, because because of the amount of time and effort it took to building these profiles within Digital Commons and then the fact that they became so stagnant, they're not yeah. dynamic. Yeah. So for a faculty member to get an email that says, hey, we just found this citation, is this your publication? Would you like to add this to your profile? Or we just found that you just got received this grant from the Department of Education. Would you like this added to your profile? So oh. it's that feature is what sold me. I mean, I didn't even believe it when I was told that <laughs> <laughs> that this was a feature. I I completely I completely didn't believe it, but it is true. <laughs> mm -hmm. It has been. But let's be very clear. I mean, that works exceptionally well for areas of study that are using, you know, the the classic journal publication model, book publication, et cetera. But right. if you're talking about um, arts and letters, more performance based. Um, creative activities, those will need to be hand entered. You know, there, yeah. there is still going to be some workload. We're looking at using students for that. You know, this, some of this, once we have a standard set up, is not that difficult. We have all sorts of people who do copy cataloging and or data entry with very specific guidelines. And I see this being the same as that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think you're absolutely right, even though the central discovery index, which is the core of where the data comes from. You know, we have almost 4 billion records at this point, and we're always adding new areas. We know that there will always be those things that we can't get at, whether they're, you know, on a hard drive somewhere, or if they're not even electronic and, and things mm -hmm. like that. So there will always be exceptions, but, you know, just relieving those day-to-day um, -day tasks so libraries can focus on more strategic initiatives like you've mentioned I think is really important. Um, here's, here's a technical question that came up um, from David uh, Schuster. Who purchased this tool? Libraries or was it a partnership? Mm. Right now no. my library is purchasing it. And we're hoping that this will become an academic affairs expense. But again, in order to center the library in the scholarly communications conversation, we felt that this was a necessary focus um, for us to be able to be at the table with faculty, especially with the changing landscape. I, you know, being an emerging research power, and the CSUs are. A stutter step behind the curve on open access and that conversation. We need to really be able to be at the table with faculty talking about where they publish and how they publish so that we can begin to lead that conversation or not lead it, that's not fair, um, but to have a voice in a conversation that we know a lot about 
And if we left this to academic affairs and they could easily handle it, they would just hand, hire staff who would do it and it would be okay-ish, but it would leave us to the side and this center is the library. And you, you sometimes have to pay to be at the table. Yeah, in our case, um, you know, the check was written by the library, but it, but we received the endorsement of the provost. Yeah. Uh, with, with the promise that, the, you know, the money will be there if, you know, so that we could make the commitment, we could follow through, and we wouldn't do all this work and have this wonderful program and platform, and then all of a sudden not be able to pay for it. So, mm -hmm. and, th and that came with the vice president of research and innovation saying, this is something we really need and him not really having the the funding himself so it's a it's, it's it's such an interesting relationship between those two positions so the provost is the one who is uh, you know the academic the senior academic officer and all these people that are doing this research and innovation are faculty members and students right <laughs> so it's like they have to work together and i think they definitely had the conversation of like okay we have to make a commitment to some sort of faculty profile tool. And this is the, you know, this is one being recommended by the library. So I think we should go with this because they're also there to do the work <laughs> mm -hmm. of, of managing it and, and negotiating it and, and it working with the ILS and the discovery tool. So it, it was definitely a conversation that had to be had outside of the library. I could have gone and, and moved money around in my budget and paid for it. But I felt like the, the provost really needed to be part of that discussion because this was a new, this is a different area that we were pushing the boundaries for the library to be a part of. And he needed to know that. And, yeah. uh, and the VPRI already knew it, but he also wanted to have that discussion with the provost. Mm -hmm. And I think it says something a lot about your leadership that you were able to get this done because it was not something where you just had some extra money and you thought, let's, let's try this out, right? You worked for <laughs> over yeah, a lots year. Of that. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm sure you you find yourself in really good company in that situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, this was a tremendous amount of work and effort and reorganization and, you know, probably fiddling around with, with budget lines or, or even more than that, all these endless conversations, all the involvement. And, you know, of course, we're just thrilled to have you as partners, but thinking more broadly about all of the attendees here and thinking about their own unique institutions, what would be some of the risks to libraries if they don't prioritize and directly support the research happening on campus? Mm. It depends how you see your library. You know, it, it really depends, you know, what what your campus will allow you to be as a library, which I never let your mm -hmm. campus limit you because that will that will put that will put baby in the corner in no time at all. <laughs> <laughs> I I really think that if we are not at the table concerning research, then we will simply be seen as a warehouse for materials and um and a place for students to study. You know, we all know that many of our faculty partners don't even understand the extent of work that we do to deliver online materials on, on every level. You know, that's an invisible yeah. labor. And so I think it will really take people back to whatever the library was when they graduated from college, whatever their last degree was, and that's how they will continue to see libraries. And we really do have skills that can help to, I keep using the term amplify, but it makes sense. You know, we can really amplify our faculty's research. And additionally, we are a somewhat neutral player in the conversation because we're not looking for um, extra credit for, for, for any of this work. We, we are really there to support all of our faculty and all of our colleges. And I, I think that you know, that that's something that we, we, we go in with kind of angel wings in many ways. People think kindly of the library when we step, step up to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, of course, I totally agree with all of that. I think that if you're if you're not working with your office of research or your division of research at your institution, they're going to set the agenda 
And they're not going to consult with you about how faculty research is going to be profiled and how we're going to connect faculty with other researchers or uh, funding sources, et cetera. They, they won't see the library as a partner if you're not advocating for it. And you, so you have to, you have to push forward. And, and I agree with Amy. I mean, if you're, if you're a teaching and research university, the library has a responsibility to, to, for both. And, and I've seen institutions where the office of research is buying electronic resources for yes. the campus because the library is not doing so. And, and, and there, and it doesn't make any sense. It's a duplication of effort that makes no sense at all. But it's usually because the library is not being proactive to to show how they support research. And a good example of that is is the Joe videos, right? So mm -hmm. there's not one office of research, one AVP of research that will say that they don't need that. <laughs> they absolutely need it. And if the library doesn't make it happen, um, and they can use, the, and that's the thing, you can you can say to your provost, hey. The Office of Research is saying we have to have this. And then the, your provost could have the conversation with them about how it's going to get paid for, but the library will manage it, right? So as long as yep. the library is still part of that conversation, um, and that's that's how you do it. Um, if you're not at the table, like Amy said, that you're you're missing out on the half of the responsibility that you have at the institution. And and never mind that. Institutions like Amy's and, and San Jose State and even Florida Gulf Coast, the whole idea about being a research and teaching institution is that you improve the teaching and the learning. Because if yeah. students are, are involved in research, they will learn so much more and, and will be way more engaged in their learning. And so then the teaching part is, also, is synonymous. It's, the, it's they're together, right? So. As, as your librarians are supporting the teaching, they should also be supporting the research. Yeah, lots of really good questions coming into chat. One yeah, question. So many. So I know. Many. <laughs> yeah. so many. Hopefully, Mark will be able to capture this for us uh, and <laughs> we can follow up a little bit. But one, one interesting question about the metrics is how do you balance, uh, and this is coming from Maureen, how do you balance the gatekeeping? Uh, of metrics versus the need to help the users of the metrics understand what they are and what they mean? Hmm. I think that's a much larger conversation. Um, you know, that's <laughs> why, and, and a couple people have said, you know, have, have the other deans, the campus deans been involved in this effort? And I said earlier on, absolutely. Every step mm -hmm. of the way that we've talked about Exploro and what it can do, we've talked to the deans, we've talked to Office of Research Affairs, we have spoken with our provost. The library itself, you know, is helping to build this, this pool of analytics. However, how they're used and, and what we focus on and, and what we ask from Ex Libris, you know, just when we come back to you and say, actually, we're not capturing this output. How do we mm -hmm. get this? That's not going to be my decision as a library dean. That's going to be something I carry forth from my other colleagues on campus. You know, this is really a group conversation. And, and this is one of the things that's exciting about being on an academic campus is we get to solve problems. We get to look at information and, and, and really try to suss out what is the necessary info that we need for the questions we're trying to answer. And then, of course, as you try to answer those questions, you just get more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but it's an ongoing iterative process. And I don't know, gatekeeping is, there's always, you know, a highlighting of, of some stats over others. But I think it's going to be the group that decides what has to come forward. So somewhat yeah. answer. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, I, I I agree with you. Um, I think one of the, so participating in that forum, one of the conversations was, well, the librarians need to be the gatekeepers of the information because we need to be able to show the limitations. We need to be able to say, this is, this is not a full picture of, or there is this confounding variable to this data, et cetera. And, 
And I think one of the things we we came to agreement on is that, well, that's higher education. That's research, right? Yeah. Every research project or or um, anytime there's a research endeavor, there's always limitations. And so to to assume that other people are aren't going to then assume that there's a limitation to the data is um, is crazy. And I think that. The, having those conversations with deans and um, your AVP of research or your VP of research and your provost, and then just talking about that, like what is the most important data that we, we need? And then mm -hmm. let's talk about the limitations of that data. If we put that data out there, what are the assumptions people are going to make? Those are some fascinating and extremely important conversations that you have to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, what you're saying is, I think that's really just going to be the future of higher ed in general. It's all about partnerships, collaborations mm -hmm. on all sides of the table. And we're also at three o'clock. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your great questions. And of course, thank you to our amazing presenters, Amy and Tracy. It's definitely been a pleasure uh, having you here. So uh, Mark, is there anything that, that you need to say before we conclude today? Just a quick reminder uh, to folks that just a quick reminder to folks that they should uh, see a link to a quick survey in their chat there. Um, if if you folks out there could take a moment just to let us know what you thought of the presentation today, we would really appreciate that. We uh, we use your feedback and and pass it along. So um, take a few minutes, and we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, otherwise, I just need to say thank you uh, to, to you, Amy, and to Tracy for, for your time today, for really a, a great presentation and for fielding so many <laughs> of the many, <laughs> many questions out there. So, um, and, and thank you, Jessica, for, for emceeing. Um, we we uh, look forward to um, seeing what, what comes out of this. So, thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.